Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Cecile Chang, and thanks for joining us for this month's Conversations with Dr. Jeff Levenshers, where we ask Dr. Jeff about COVID-19 and what employers can do to respond to the ever-evolving landscape. So, Dr. Jeff, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, too, Cecile. Wow, a lot has happened in the last few weeks. Um, I've heard Omicron is much less dangerous, but I've also heard that hospitals are full and death rates, unfortunately, are not abating. Can you give us a bit of an overview of what's going on now? Yeah, there's really good evidence that Omicron causes fewer emergency room visits, fewer hospitalizations, fewer people being on ventilators. The problem is that so, so many more people are getting infected. The rates of new infection uh, are actually higher than the rates of new infection were at the beginning of the Delta wave, at, you know, at the beginning of the spring 2020 wave. So even if you have fewer people who are having serious side, of, side effects from uh, Omicron, you still end up with more hospitalization. I think the death rate so that we're seeing now are still really from Delta. They're not They're not from Omicron. So hopefully that's something where we will not see an increase. We're also seeing a much bigger increase in rate of hospitalization in places where there's lower rates of immunization. So, uh, or vaccination. So, I mean, I, you know, so for, for right now, um, when you hear that hospitals are in a crisis, they are definitely in a crisis. One more point is that just like airlines are having a hard time keeping up with their flights because they have a lot of crew that are sick, the same thing's going on in, in hospitals and in healthcare settings. Now, most of the healthcare workers that are sick are probably not getting sick in the hospital or in their, in their healthcare offices. They're getting sick outside, but when they have Omicron, even if they have no symptoms because they're fully vaccinated and boosted, they still can't go to work. So, you know, we have lower capacity also because of, because of, uh, because of sick employees. So you actually brought up a nice segue to my next question because you mentioned breakthrough infections. And um, I used to know no one who had uh, COVID-19, and now almost everyone I know has had COVID-19. Um, what are your thoughts for how people should be thinking about vaccinations? Well, in a sense, um, part, of why, part of why we see far fewer people getting sick now is because Omicron seems to collect less in the lungs, and that's great. But part of why we're seeing less people get sick is simply that uh, more, more people are vaccinated and more people have immunity, either immunity from vaccination or immunity from um, a past COVID infection. So, uh, um, so essentially, the importance of vaccination is even higher with this huge spike in uh, in infections that you know we want everybody possible to be a break in the chain of transmission you know the way things are going um, the best time to have gotten your covid booster was clearly a few weeks ago but the best time as of now to get your covid booster it's really now it's not like waiting a couple of days or certainly a couple of weeks right um, it sounded like the CDC has changed its definition of up to date on vaccines what does this mean for employers? The CDC has said that uh, has said that fully vaccinated remains the same. Just a single shot of Johnson and Johnson, two shots, um, um, you know, three weeks or a month apart for Pfizer and, and Moderna. Um, but um, what they're saying from from the perspective of when you need to quarantine or isolate, whether you consider yourself vaccinated, they're now saying that if you are not up to date on your booster, you're not really considered up to date on vaccinations. So if you're eligible for a booster to be considered um, vaccinated, um, you, you need you need to get that booster. For employers, though, it doesn't it, uh, because the definition of fully vaccinated hasn't changed. Employers don't have to insist on the booster as part of a mandate. They could. And we're seeing a number of employers uh, in the university space in the government space in the financial services space start requiring booster shots as part of an employee mandate. But employers don't have to do that based on the CDC's new guidance. Got it. OK. Um I myself have spent some time waiting in lines for testing over the past few weeks. Um, where do we stand as a nation with respect to testing and what do you recommend for employers? 
Yeah, we still we, we're still in a messy position. So there's not enough. I mean, there are so many people seeking um, PCR tests that there's just not enough PCR testing capacity. It's actually it actually is very expensive to set up new capacity, and because people keep on thinking that uh, we're not going to have new waves, they they don't spend the money to set up new capacity. It also requires a lot of skilled um, skilled labor, and that's actually hard to come by right now. So um, so. You know, PCR tests are the most sensitive, the most likely to pick up somebody who has COVID. However, the rapid antigen tests, which are done at home and take 15 minutes, they're actually very good at detecting people who are contagious. They might not be quite as good with Omicron as they were with um, the Delta variant, but but they're still pretty good. And I think that when people are looking for a, a test, it is reasonable to go for antigen tests, especially if the alternative is waiting four hours in the uh, in the cold or in the rain to uh, to get a PCR test. The other issue is that PCR tests are most valuable if you can get the results quickly. And there's been such a run on them that there are labs that are taking 72 or 96 hours to get um, test results back. And obviously, if you get a test result back four days later, it's not really very valuable. It doesn't help you keep keep from infecting somebody else. Right. No, absolutely. Um, I have also heard that a number of schools are either closing or moving some classrooms to online. Um, What are your thoughts for, and this, of course, creates big challenges for working parents. What do you think we can expect from a nationwide standpoint with respect to school closings? You know, I think schools are having the same problem that airlines and, frankly, hospitals are having, which is that they have staff who are getting sick and uh, or staff. And even if they're feeling perfectly well, if they test positive, they really can't be uh, can't can't be coming to school and have to isolate for a period of time. So uh, I think that. You know, this makes uh, this makes um, being sure that adult staffers of schools are uh, are vaccinated even more important. Um, there are some school systems that have started having vaccination requirements for students that obviously can help. I think we all realize that we need schools open. We need schools open because um, it's really bad for kids, the kids' um, intellectual development, also their social development to be out, out of school. It's obviously bad for employers with their employees, uh, um, you know, not, not being able to work regularly because of the uncertainty of school. But I think we have to recognize that during the worst of this Omicron wave, there will be many schools that will close, at least intermittently. And some of that is just a matter of you can't keep a school open if you don't have the right staff to uh, you know, to teach or even to keep people safe. So I think we have to just expect that. Okay. Um, There have been some reports that children represent more of the hospitalizations from COVID than they did previously. What are your thoughts about that? It looks like Omicron is no more dangerous for kids than other uh, than other variants have been. But there are two differences. One is what we've already talked about, which is that Omicron is so much more contagious. So many more people are getting it. So kids are going to have more exposures to it. The other is that um, kids are way, way less vaccinated than adults. Kids under five can't be vaccinated. And kids between five and 11 you know, the vaccination rate's about 15 percent, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, amongst adults, it's, you know, 75 or so. So uh, so we need we need to get more kids vaccinated. That will help. The good news is we still don't have that many children who are uh, who are having very bad consequences from COVID, but but some will. So the best thing is, you know, parents vaccinate your kids and obviously, you know, do our best to uh, to reduce exposures. But it's very hard right now because there is so much Omicron around. Right. Right. Related to that. Um, and I have a personal interest in this question myself, uh, being the mother of a teenage boy. But there are some new studies that are talking about complications of the COVID vaccine, specifically with teenage boys. What's your recommendation with respect to booster shots there? Yeah. So um, so the study you're talking about came for, from Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest. And what it showed is that it, it, with a very, very careful record review, they found somewhat more cases of, uh, of, of heart inflammation than have been previously reported. Um, on the other hand, can, it continues to be the case that it's much more likely to get heart inflammation in anybody of any age from COVID than from a vaccine. Um, you know, at this point, it is much safer for uh, teenage boys to be vaccinated than not to be vaccinated. So the strong recommendation continues to be 
get kids vaccinated. And the CDC also just evaluated the question of should we be, uh, you know, should we be doing booster shots on teenagers and even on kids as young as five? And they just concluded that looking at all the evidence, yep, we should we should be giving booster shots too. So I think the I think the recommendation really hasn't changed. And uh, you know, and again, um, kids recover very well from this, and they are more likely to have long term side effects from getting actual COVID than from the vaccine. All right. It sounds like it's time for the booster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there has been a lot of news in, in about the oral treatments for COVID. Um, when do you think we're going to be able to get some relief from that in that respect? You know, there are two drugs. There's the Pfizer drug Paxlovid and there's the Merck drug Molnupiravir. And uh, um, the Pfizer drug is substantially more effective, almost 90 percent effective at keeping high risk people out of the hospital. If it's given within three to five days, the Molnupiravir, the, uh, um, the Merck drug, it's only about 30 percent effective. That's still better than not having a drug. They're both. Um, they're both uh, have emergency use authorization from the FDA. Neither one is available as of the time we're recording this, but I expect over the next week or two or three, these probably will become available. They're still really going to only be available to people who are at high risk of complications of COVID, so they won't be available to everybody. They're not recommended to give to people who have an exposure. They'll only be recommended to give to people who have laboratory documented. Um, COVID, it'll actually make um, rapid tests even more important because, you know, people need a rapid result. And, uh, you know, a result from a PCR test that you're going to get four days later is not going to be helpful at all for this. But I, I do think over time, these drugs are going to be an important piece of the exit ramp from the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I remember even last month, you talked about uh, Omicron being a potential element of the exit ramp. Do you have a sense of the length of that ramp at this moment? Uh, well, people are suggesting that uh, that the worst, you know, in South Africa, the Omicron um, wave was actually relatively short and uh, like four to six weeks. Now, South Africa is a little different than us. It's also summer there now and it's winter in, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and, you know, the population is a bit younger as well. I think we have to see, but um, it looks like in the UK where they do a lot of viral sequencing, uh, Omicron has totally taken over from uh, from Delta. In the US, Delta represents less than 5% of all the infections now. And limiting the number of people who have the, the um, variant that causes much more disease is going to be very helpful in terms of getting us back toward something like normal. But obviously, you know, at a at a point where we have uh, you know over a million people a day getting getting infected in the U.S., we're we're, we're clearly not at normal now. I, I mean, I'm I'm guardedly optimistic that over the coming weeks this will this will come down very substantially. Um, but I think all of us need to do our part to uh, to be sure to make this happen. And that includes, uh, you know, that includes getting vaccinated or getting boosted if appropriate. It also includes uh, includes wearing masks um, when you're indoors with other people from outside of your households. It includes, you know, keeping more of a distance. It might mean that we don't go to restaurants or bars or uh you know, or sports games for a little bit while there's so much around. And I think that's, I think it's going to be for a limited period of time. I don't think that's going to be something we have to live with, you know, over a long period of time. Well, I will take a limited period of time any day of the week. So thank yes. you for that. Um, any final thoughts to wrap us up? Well, you know, Cecile, I think that we really are at an inflection point in the uh, in the pandemic, and um, you know, there is there is the promise that over the over the coming weeks and months, we are going to have much less uh, less disease, and we'll continue to have better treatments as well. For the meantime, what it's best for us to do is to be careful. And, uh, you know, wear masks when we're going indoors with other people. Try to avoid places where um, we're less we're less likely to wear masks, uh, like restaurants and gyms for a little bit. And I think it'll only be for a little bit. It's not not really for the long term. But I'm, I'm very optimistic that over the coming weeks and months, we will see less COVID and things will get much better. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jeff, and thank you all for joining us for this month's conversations with Dr. Jeff. We will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.